Hello, good evening. I'm Dr. Lundberg. Um, I'll be giving a presentation today on spinal cord stimulators. I know um, a lot of patients that come into my clinic have a lot of questions about them. Some people have heard about them. Some people have never heard about them. Um, but I feel a lot of people have questions about them once they hear like what they're for and what they can do. So that's what this presentation tonight is about, is just kind of get a basic understanding of um, who uh, qualifies for them, um, what kind of pains and pathologies are good for treating, and um, kind of how the whole trial implant works, the whole process is. So I did uh, my residency in anesthesia, and then I did a fellowship in interventional spine and pain medicine in, uh, in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I have no disclosures, so I'm not getting any financial uh, benefits from any companies or any spinal cord stimulator reps. Um, the agenda, again, um, I guess spinal cord stimulators in a broader sense is termed neuromodulation, modulating nerves to uh, um, correct the pain signals, I suppose. So how does it work? Just a basic understanding of the mechanics of it. Um, who's it for? You know, what are the good patient candidates for this therapy? Uh, an overview of what the trial looks like and what the implant process looks like. And just a real quick couple of slides and some of the evidence, okay, of the, how this works. So neuromodulation was actually developed in the 1960s, and the whole idea is that low voltage electrical current can actually inhibit the transmission of pain signals in nerve cells. And this applies throughout the whole body. So, you know, you can do a peripheral nerve stimulation of the vagus nerve. Some people are doing that for uh, like depression uh, or obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, they can do uh, neuromodulation in the brain called deep brain stimulation. This is more for people with like epilepsy or Parkinson's disease. Spinal cord stimulators, which we're talking about, that was FDA approved in 1989. This is more about doing stimulation in the spine to help, you know, pain in the neck, pain in the back, pain in the extremities. And then, of course, uh, like transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, like a TENS unit. Everyone's heard of a TENS unit. It kind of works in the same idea. Obviously, that's a little bit less invasive, but people use TENS machines for chronic back pain or even post-surgical pain and things like that. So the technology of neuromodulation has been around for decades. Um, the way it works is termed the gate theory, the gate control theory of pain. It was first proposed in 1965 by Merzak and Wall. Um, the idea, and there's a lot of different ways of, of thinking about it, and I, I got some pictures there, noise canceling headphones for pace, pain signals or uh, similar to a TENS unit that goes inside your body or underneath your skin. Um, a way I like to describe it is, you know, you think of the five-year-old that gets a cut on their hand, you know, what do they do? They, they, they rub their whole hand because somehow that makes it feel better. Well, there's only so many nerves and pain signals can get up through your spinal cord and get up to your brain so that you can perceive it. So if you stimulate all the nerves in your hand, it tends to drown out the ones that are causing pain. And that's essentially how this neuromodulation technology works. You are, we put a stimulator in your spine and it's essentially putting in white noise and drowning out the pain signals that are coming up from below it. Um, it works in you know, two broad categories of pain. So you know this, and these are kind of fancy terms, but nociceptive pain and there's neuropathic pain. So nociceptive pain is the dull, throbbing pain from tissue injury. So this is if you get a cut, this is if you have surgery and the next day your knee hurts because you had a knee replacement, or you fall and you bruise yourself. This is like tissue damage. You know, this is inflammation, swelling, uh, damage to the nerve injuries of the tissue themselves. Stimulators don't particularly work too well on this type of trauma. Stimulators work much better for neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is usually described as burning, numbness, tingling, shooting pains. Um, this can certainly be caused by trauma, but can certainly be caused by many other things like in diabetic neuropathy, it's the elevated glucose in the blood. Um, some people just have bad luck and have peripheral neuropathy. But these stimulators tend to work a lot better for neuropathic type pains. And we'll get more into that. And you can see how a lot of the indications or the patient candidates for this therapy tends to revolve around that type of pain more than other things. Uh, let's see. So again, who is spinal cord stimulator for? So again, think of neuropathic pain. Uh, the most common diagnosis we use for, for stimulators is just 
we call it post-laminectomy syndrome or just failed back syndrome. So these are people who had back surgery and you know, obviously you got some back pain for a few months, you do your rehab, but maybe you still have back pain six months, a year, five years later, you're still dealing with back pain. Or maybe you had a pinched nerve in your back and you had shooting pains down your right leg for a long period of time until they figured out what the problem was. Well, you go have surgery, they unpinch the nerve, and um, you still have, I mean, it improves your pain, but you still kind of got this pain down your right leg. And, you know, they get new imaging. No, the surgery went great. There's nothing pinched. Um, you know, that nerve just got damaged from being pinched too long, and now you're kind of stuck. So that would be like a perfect candidate for something like a spinal cord stimulator. Uh, other diagnoses, people think of a complex regional pain syndrome, um, also known as RSD or reflex sympathetic dystrophy. That's kind of an older term. Uh, also, Kazalgia, phantom leg pain, if you have like an amputation, that can cause a lot of significant nerve damage because you just cut through a nerve. Uh, any spinal cord injuries, post-herpetic neuralgia after you get shingles, you know, you get a virus in your spine, it causes a shingle flare-up, the rash goes away, but then you're stuck with damaged nerves and you have a constant pain on your thorax. So that's a, a, a good classic example. Uh, chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. Actually, one of the newer indications that just came out in the last year or so is for peripheral neuropathy due to diabetes, which is obviously uh, very common. There's a lot of diabetics in this country. And the longer you have diabetes, especially if it's uncontrolled, you run the risk of starting to damage your nerves, mostly in the feet and the lower extremities. Again, that's a good indication. That is definitely neuropathic type pain. And another newer indication is we call it non-surgical back pain. They're trying to, ex it's been working really well for neuropathic pain and they're kind of expanding these out. Um, you know, sometimes patients are not a candidate for surgery for whatever reason with their surgeons. Maybe it's um, too dangerous for the patient or maybe the surgeons don't see enough on the MRI to warrant surgery. They're not really sure what to fix. You failed a lot of other things. You know, maybe a stimulator is worth a try. So that's kind of some newer things that came out this past year. Um, it's certainly not the first thing you should think about. You know, this is a long road. This is, you know, you, you, don't, you don't have back pain for two months and then go to your doctor and ask for a, a, a stimulator trial. You know, a lot of things, and I, I'm, it kind of goes for all patients, but I kind of always go back to back pain, but like physical therapy, right? You start easy. You don't start with surgery. You don't start with invasive techniques. You start with physical therapy, you give that a good run, maybe even do two or three rounds of it if you're making some progress, even if it's slowly. Uh, medications, anti-inflammatory medication, ibuprofen, Tylenol, the simple things, maybe they escalate you up to muscle relaxants, or even neuropathic pain medicine, gabapentin, Lyrica, these are pretty common medications out there in the community. Even and opioids are certainly play a role in some cases. Um, when those easy things tend to fail, you know, most people are going to head in at injections. You think of epidurals, you think of ablations, blocks. You know, these are, you know, if it doesn't work, you know, that's unfortunate, but no harm, no foul. It didn't work, you move on to other things. Um, stimulators and surgeries are a little bit beyond that, you know. Surgery is certainly uh, kind of the last step. I tell my patients, you know, uh, injections are over here, surgeries over here, I'd say a stimulator is about in the middle. It's certainly more involved than just an injection you come in for and hopefully it works, and it's certainly a lot less invasive and permanent than surgery. Um, so, and of course, you know, certainly can, it's a long road to do this, and then you add on insurance approvals and stuff, it can make it even longer, right? Um, so who are, when I'm talking about all this neuropathic pain, who are the good candidates. Um, we know neuropathic pain is important. Um, pain that is 24-7. You know, I don't know if a stimulator is appropriate for someone who says they have back pain three or four times a month, right? And these are more for the chronic pains that people are really struggling um, to have something implanted in your body for an intermittent pain. I don't know, may not be a good fit. Um, pains that are are not primary mechanical. What that means is, you know, you're not a surgical candidate. And that means, you know, if you have a problem in your spine, there's a pinched nerve, there's a, there's a misalignment, or you have severe arthritis in your knee, you know, that needs to be fixed, right? There's a surgical solution for that. And this is not about masking problems and allowing them to get worse and no one's following them anymore, you know? This is um, certainly something we do more of a last resort especially if you're not allowed to have surgery or can't have surgery or they don't think surgery would be beneficial for you. Um, certainly, you know, you want to make sure 
patients don't have a lot of other psych issues, drug disorders, um, depressions, dementia is a big one too. Um, I, we talk about no other medical con conditions that would preclude implantation. Um, sometimes people being on blood thinners or having a lot of heart issues uh, can make it a little difficult because it certainly is kind of a minor surgery. So a lot of times you still need surgical clearances to have these implanted. <clears throat> and of course, these things are going to get expensive. So you want your insurance to, to cover it. Um, so here is a picture of a spinal cord stimulant. I actually have an example this time of uh, one of the companies we use. <clears throat> so this is about how big, this is the battery, we call it an IPG. And it's the battery and kind of the computer that does all the work. This is the, about what would be implanted underneath your skin if you had one implanted. Um, the battery itself lasts anywhere from five to 10 years, depending on what your settings are like. And this is what the leads look like. And we'll get more into what the pictures, but just so you have an idea what I'm talking about, there are eight contacts on the lead and they are all individually programmed and all go at different levels and they play off polarity to get better coverage. But this lead is what's going on up in your spine next to your nerves and putting in all this white noise that will help mask your pain. And these leads come down and, out, and then come out of your spine and you implant the battery usually in your low back around the buttocks area. And each one gets two, one for each side. So just get an idea of what the size of these is. And as you can see in this picture here, that's the IPG under x-ray imaging. So that's implanted underneath the skin. You can kind of follow the lead that goes in they anchor it outside, it enters the spine, and then up top you can see the electrodes and the leads, those little white contacts. Um, perfect, so a trial. So you start off, and that, that is one of the, actually the really nice things about these stimulators is you can do a trial. So you can try it before you buy it. You know, it's not like we go cut you open, put this in your spine and say, good luck, I, I hope that worked for you, right? No one wants to do that. So you typically do a five to seven day trial and you put the leads in, into your spine, exactly where they would go if you put the implant. The leads come out of your skin and you tape the battery, it's a different battery, but one like this, onto your low back for about a week and you just see how effective it's gonna work. Um, you know, during those five to seven days, they can certainly kind of play with the program a little bit, but um, they would consider these trials successful if you get more than 50% pain relief, if you use less pain medicine, you sleep better, you're more active, these are the things we start talking about when whether we decide whether to implant after a trial or not. Um, there is definitely some prep work that goes in before you do a trial, um, uh, including MRIs or CT scans of the spine, because that's where we're actually gonna put these leads. We wanna make sure there's enough space to put these in, there's nothing that's gonna block it. And then, they'll usually ask for, they call it a psychological clearance. And some people are usually a little surprised by this, but everyone in America has to get a psychological clearance before we do a trial. Um, it's just kind of how the whole thing got started. And I think the, the main reason is they're looking for, you know, they don't want people who are doing drugs or alcoholics. They want to make sure you don't have dementia. They want to understand that you have um, reasonable expectations for how this stimulator is going to work, right? I mean, it, we program this to kind of cover your baseline pain. You know, if you got pain in your right foot and we do a stimulator trial and it helps, that's great. But if you stub your toe, it's going to hurt. You can still touch your hand. If you cut your toe, it will hurt. You can still feel. It's not like your entire body goes numb and you can't feel anything. Um, that being said, you know, we are putting these leads in your spine and sometimes that puts people off, but I like to compare this to a labor epidural. This is essentially the exact same thing as a labor, labor epidural that we use for pregnant patients who are having C-sections or vaginal deliveries. It's the exact same space, you know, before in the, in the OB department, we slide these little catheters up in the epidural space and they infuse basically numbing or local anesthetic medication around the spinal cord and it numbs half their body and then they can go on with the delivery. The spinal cord stimulator is more of an electronic device. It is instead of a catheter, it's a little lead that goes up in the same space and we turn it on to inhibit the pain signals. We obviously are not putting local anesthetic in there and making all your legs numb. We're programming it to cover your baseline pain. Um, so that's the trial. Here's a picture of me doing a trial. So these trials are usually done 
in a procedure center. So this is not done in the hospital. The trials are done usually, if, you're, if you've done back injections or epidurals, it's done in the same place. It probably takes anywhere from a half hour to an hour. You go home that day. You can certainly do it under sedation and they can kind of knock you out for a little bit to put this in. But it's, as you can see, it's done under a fluoroscopy, which is live x-ray. You know, we don't put these in blindly. We want to make sure it's going in safely. And the picture on the right there, that's what it looks like when we tape the battery on your back. So that's the, the, the battery right here. We put a bunch of tape around it. Patient goes home that day, and we kind of see how they do. So during that week, you're, pretty, you're in pretty close contact with whatever stimuli or device representative you're working with. Um, some of them have you log your pain scores and you know how well you're sleeping on a day-to-day -day basis can we, so we can kind of see where it's going. You know, if things aren't looking right, we can make adjustments, we can change the programming, we can adjust the leads. So it's important to keep that communication open during that week so we can make sure you have a successful trial and also to know that if it's not successful that we did everything we can to make it work and you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work and then you just saved yourself an implant that wouldn't work. So that's the trial. Um, let's see. Yep, most stocks will have you do antibiotics during that trial. Obviously, these things, these leads are sticking out of your skin, and you don't want to get an infection. Um, there's no incisions. There's no stitches. There's no staples. This is just kind of a a little bit bigger needle than most of the injections we do. And at the end of the week, whether it is a good week or a bad week, we pull the leads out. So the trial, when the trial is over, we pull the leads out in the office and they come out probably in about 10 seconds and then we kind of discuss whether or not you want to pursue the implant. Um, if the implant, if it's successful and you want to move on to the implant, you know, that's done in the hospital. That needs to be done on their sterile field. You know, obviously we have to make an incision to put the IPG or the battery underneath. That all needs to be done sterile because you don't want any infection. And that's usually done in like a, uh, like an outpatient surgery setting usually takes anywhere from an hour or two to put one in and then you go home and you know obviously a little sore back for a couple days until that heals up so just what I said a same day surgery center um, the stim layer itself once you implant it obviously you can control it usually with usually with your phone or remote um, to change the settings um, some of the newer versions can actually be programmed through the internet. So if you have problems or have issues, you need help, sometimes you can just, you know, you call your stimulator rep and they can, you're at home and they go on the internet and they can start adjusting it and start, you know, trying to fix the problem uh, just over the internet. Uh, I like the, patients always like to know that they can control it themselves, right? You can turn it up, you can turn it down, you can have different programs already set onto the controller so you can change depending on which one, which, what kind of pain you're feeling or if it's worse or if it's nighttime, you like to turn it this way. There's definitely a lot of options you have, but I also like to instill the idea that, you know, this is not, this is for your baseline pain. The better way of looking at it is once you kind of get it in a good spot, you leave it alone. You know, everyone has good days and bad days, and if you wake up and you have a bad day, you know, you don't go and mess with this because when you change the settings on these, it usually takes about a day to wash in and wash out. It's not like an immediate effect. So if you change it and you bump it up one or two, you might feel a little bit, but it'll take a day or so for that to really wash in and take an effect and really start washing out those nerve signals. So this is not something that you're playing with every day. You kind of set it, you get in a good spot. Obviously, if you have three or four weeks in a row that ain't working, that's definitely a time to start changing the controls and changing the settings. Um, also, I have patients, we put these in and, you know, they kind of come back a year later and they say, oh, I haven't been very happy with it for six months. It doesn't seem to work as well. You know, speak up. These are, these are normal things that come up and we can certainly work through them, you know, and we'll get it, I think it's in my next slide. Yeah, the risk. So, you know, obviously we do this in a hospital. We don't want infections. We do, you know, in a sterile field in the OR. But lead migration is something, is one of the most common complications. And what that refers to is, you know, we put these leads in the spine in a very specific spot to get pain coverage. And if they tend to move, then you kind of lose coverage and doesn't work as well. Well, after about three, four months after you implant these, the lead migration rates drop significantly and that's because you get scar tissue around those leads and they tend to get stuck there and that's a good thing because then they're not moving. 
But if you get a little scar tissue, you know, you got to usually get it reprogrammed to help push that signal through the scar tissue so it's, it still kind of reaches the, the spinal cord nerves. So, you know, it's not uncommon if you're having problems, you talk to your rep, you talk to your doctor, a lot of times it just needs a reprogram and kind of re readjust your settings so you get better coverage. Um, another thing I, on the last slide was, you know, you, once you get the implant, you certainly can have these removed as well, which obviously is not ideal, but certainly happens sometimes. Maybe you put a stimulator in because you had some back pain after a surgery, it's good for five years, but you know, it's not uncommon to develop other problems. As we age, other things degenerate, maybe you get another disc protrusion, you know, you're pinching a different nerve, it, it, you know, the stimulator is not enough, or, or whatever reason, maybe the leg starts feeling weak, you know, sometimes it's hard, there are some MRI restrictions sometimes, sometimes surgeons have a hard time getting around the leads, so sometimes we, we take these out, and then you can go address what you gotta do surgically if need be. Um, other risk, obviously these, these uh, leads can fracture, that's a pretty rare thing, and I touched on the MRI restrictions. Most companies have this figured out by now. You can, most of them will get full body MRIs at like a 1.5 Tesla, which is a slightly lower setting than some, but certainly well within reason. Um, but certainly, you know, MRIs of your head, hands, elbow, the only time you, things get a little touchy is if you're trying to MRI right over the leads or the battery. But like I said, a lot of these computers and these IPGs now have MRI modes, they have surgery modes, and they kind of take them out. So that's been addressed pretty well recently. Not so much a problem as it was five, 10 years ago. Um, I'd go back to, again, it's a long road. You know, people wonder, well, you know, I got back pain, I had a back surgery, it's been two months, should I get a stimulator? Yeah, I mean, you give it time, I'd say anywhere between six and 12 months. You know, if you still got pain 12 months after a surgery, and the surgeon's saying, you know, everything looks good, you know, and then you maybe start thinking about having uh, a talk about doing a stimulator trial. Because um, obviously, it, it, there's a lot of other things you've done in that six to 12 months. This is not something to just jump to. Um, so, right, we talk about the therapy development, so that's, that's the physical therapy, the meds, uh, the, the easy stuff, the less invasive treatments. Um, and then you try to get the trial approved. So, you know, a lot of insurances will say four to six weeks to get one approved. Then you get scheduled. And then if it's a successful trial, you want to move on to implant. Well, now it might take, an, you know, some insurances, if you have a successful trial, it's an immediate approval for an implant because they already know that's what we're thinking. Sometimes they, you know, kick it around for a month before they give us an approval. So, and then obviously you post implant, you figure it's about, I mean, we put it in, we put the, when you implant, I see patients a week later, that's typically when we turn it on after surgery, and we still have stitches, you don't take a shower for two weeks, you kinda got a you know, sponge bath and things like that. But usually at two weeks, I let my patients kinda no restrictions, most of the, the surgical incisions are healed that they can shower and bathe and do what they need to do. Um, but like I said, there's not a lot of downtime with these. I just warn patients about that lean migration. You know, people get these stimulators, they feel great, they've had back pain for five years, now they're feeling good, they wanna go to the gym, they wanna do all this fun stuff. And I just always remind them, like three to four months, let those, scar, the, those leads scar in so you don't run the risk of a lead migration. Um, just live your normal life, don't do anything extreme like jackhammer or horseback riding or jet skiing, things like that. Um, so evidence-based outcomes, just two quick slides. I mean, like I said, this, is, this was FDA approved in 1989. So, you know, obviously there was a lot of research before that to get the approval. That was 30 years ago. The technology has come a long way since then. Um, I, I got on this slide, tonic stimulation. That's, that was the original type of stimulation where it was, you would always feel it in both your legs. You might always feel a little numbness and tingling. That's kind of older technology. All the new ones essentially is called paresthesia free. So the whole idea is to just mask the pain that you're having and live a normal life and you probably will just forget that this thing is on 24 seven. But you know, here, here's one of, the tech, one of the newer technologies, birth stimulation. You know, they had 970 patients over 10 years and 20 studies, all level one randomly controlled studies and, it, and they came out looking great. Here's a, a, a review published in Pain Physician, one of the big articles. Significant level one evidence of efficacy of a spinal cord stimulation for failed back. People have already had back surgery and still having back and leg pain. Um, 
I put this study from 2019 in here, 400 patients who had stimulators implanted for two years for neuropathic pain. And, look, and, and these numbers, and this is pretty typical for a lot of these, 89% of patients reported 50% pain relief or better, 91% still satisfied with the treatment two years later, and 93% would do it again, uh, would undergo the same treatment if they had the same problem. So that, that's pretty typical. It's not like we're you know, looking at, oh, 30, 40% success rates. I mean, when it works, it works fantastic. And um, like I said, over 50% is successful. I love it when patients are like in the 70, 80, 90%, and it's just an easy home run. Um, and I got one more slide on DRG and, and versus spinal cord stimulator. I bring this up because I get a lot of questions about it. This is even a, kind of a the next level of where neuromodulation is going, and it's called uh, DRG, dorsal root ganglia. It is also a spinal cord stimulator. It has leads very similar to this, except they're smaller. But as you can see in the picture, it's more for like if you have a very specific area of pain. You know, we put these stimulator leads for what we call traditional spinal cord stimulator. It actually goes more in your thoracic spine. So if you have back pain and leg pain, you have a fusion surgery at the bottom of your back, the leads actually go pretty high up in your spine in order to cover your whole low back and all of your legs. But you know, what if you had a, a knee replacement? And unfortunately, it's been two or three years. You've always had pain in that knee after the surgery. And you know, the surgeons take x-rays, they do imaging, and they all say the hardware looks good and no one wants to replace it and you're just kind of stuck. You know, you don't need to put leads to cover your entire lower half of your body. You could put one lead over the one nerve that covers the area of pain over your knee and you'll get a much more dense coverage. So um, you can see on this picture right here, here's the same thing, here's the leads, the battery is not in the picture, but here's these leads coming up and instead of seeing the contacts in the middle of your spine way up high, you can see how you have one lead for one nerve coming out of the spine and they kind of hit it on the side as the nerve is exiting the spine, that's where the dorsal root ganglia is. It, basically transmit a lot of the pain signals. It's where there's a lot of connections. But like I said, here's a you know, chronic post-surgical pain. You know, people have had knee replacements. Say 15% of people still have chronic post-surgical pain you know, years after the surgery and they, they kind of get stuck. There's no surgical option. So maybe a DRG would be good and just focus all of the therapy just on the knee to get nice solid coverage. You know, foot and ankle surgery, 5%. Um, C-sections, pelvic pain, amputations is certainly a wide percentage, um, but something to think in mind, and this is not something I would expect a patient to come in and say, oh, I need a DRG. This is definitely something you talk with the provider about, about you know, what type of therapy is good for you, what type of stimulation, what wavelength, you know, is a DRG a good idea? You know, you, you don't want to put DRGs through eight nerves in your spine. That's kind of a little ridiculous. Um, again, so there are many options out there and uh, your provider can certainly talk to you a lot about this stuff. I talk about different wavelengths. You'll hear tonic is the original, you hear burst, you hear high frequency, there's DRG, there's different types of battery options. You know, do you want a rechargeable one? Do you want a non-rechargeable one? Um, as a point, a, a non-rechargeable battery, like I said, it lasts five to seven years. Replacing it, is, it literally takes probably 20 minutes. I mean, you're not replacing the leads and, and, and pulling all that out. You're just opening up that little pocket and changing out to the newest battery. Um, they even make some now with external power sources. So maybe you only you know, need to put the battery on. You just kind of you know, elastic band on your body and wear it at night only. Um, different, one, different companies have different MRI compatibility. These are certainly something to talk about that your provider can discuss with you. Um, so if you're wondering, I mean, I hope you got a little bit of background information, have a little better idea of how this whole process works. And of course, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, like, is this something for me? You know, how did your pain start? Was this from a surgery? Was this something that, you know, you, you, your surgeon says, you know, they see the problem, but they can't fix it because you have other health problems. They don't think surgery is safe. Um, do you feel this is like a neuropathic pain? And, and, I, and I, I did this lecture a couple years ago and I had a lot of patients, you know, I got a lot of, well, is my pain neuropathic? Everyone, you know, I make a big point of that. Um, and it, it's hard, you know, certainly if there's numbness and tingling in both your feet and you have diabetes for a long time, that's an easy one. You know, if you have shooting pain shooting down your leg, that's an easy one. You know, if you have knee pain after a knee surgery, you know, it's been a couple years, I mean, that's tough because you had a knee replacement, maybe there's nerve damage, but it's not shooting up and down. 
you know, but then why do you have pain two years later? So there's definitely some gray zone, it's hard, and that's why we do trials, right? You don't wanna have this implanted if it's not gonna work. Um, where do you hurt, right? This is not good. You know, unfortunately, if you have like fibromyalgia, if you have pain in the shoulders, the hips, the back, the, you know, it, that's too broad a coverage, you know? Certainly DRG is very specific. You know, these spinal cord stimulators, maybe low back and legs, maybe neck and arms, but these are not meant for kind of this full body pain. If you have, um, you know, some sort of systemic illness, that's a very difficult thing and the, the, the coverage isn't wide enough for that. Um, what does your pain feel like? Does it feel like nerve pain? Um, how bad is your pain? I mean, I certainly see people every day with pain and that doesn't mean I go and plant these things in everybody's body. Maybe your pain is manageable with less invasive techniques and that's fine. You know, you don't need to push it this far to have this thing implanted in you. And how does the pain affect your life? I mean, maybe your pain is not that bad on an everyday basis, but you've lived with it for five years and it's really starting to wear you down. I mean, that's a different way, a different topic to think about. Um, and that pretty much covers it. Um, I certainly, I think they've been collecting some questions that people are asking online, but I'm Dr. Lundberg again. I work in the uh, Mason Gilbert offices, but certainly all the core offices have pain providers that do spinal cord stimulator trials and implants, and you know, you don't necessarily have to come out to the east side to see me. Uh, all the core offices offer this service. So the first thing you do is you, you talk to your pain provider about this. If you don't have a pain provider, maybe ask your surgeon or whoever your PCP is to get referred to a pain provider. Um, and you can start having discussion like, hey, I heard about a stimulator, this is my pain, this has been going on, what's the history, what's been done already? You know, and um, most of us can give you a good idea like how successful we think this is gonna be. You know, we don't wanna trial um, everybody. You know, we wanna pick our good candidates. I think my conversion rate is probably around 90%. You know, if, if I do 10 trials, maybe I'll get one, maybe two fails, and the rest are working. Um, some people go the other way. I mean, you can, I, got, I know offices that are 60% and they're trialing a, a wider group of people. But certainly something to talk to about a pain provider, most interventional pain docs and all the pain docs at CORE uh, offer this. So a lot of that depends on your insurance. Like I said, some of them are immediate and you can, I have pulled leads out on a Tuesday and planted in them on a Saturday. Um, other ones, you know, take a few weeks to get through. Um, a lot of it that depends on insurance companies and just schedules in the OR and when your provider can get you in. So if it works out, sometimes it's very quickly. There's nothing unsafe about having a trial and implanting later as long as everything works out. Yep, 100%, and that's what's so great about these stimulators, and I, I touched on it a little bit before, how these stimulator leads, they go really high in your spine. They're up in more like the thoracic level, kind of T7, it's almost like to the bottom of your shoulder blades, and that allows us, I mean, some, I mean you got L5, S1 fusion, okay. You know, some people have L2 to S1 fusion, and the whole low back is scar tissue and, and hardware and screws and rods, and, and you're 100% right, doing injections on those backs it's difficult, it's very hard, it's hard to find the spaces, and it would be nearly impossible to fish a lead up through a back like that. However, the leads don't need to be anywhere near that. In fact, we, we don't touch it, we're just trying to mask pain in that area. So a lot of these leads that we implant, we're entering into the spine usually at like T12, L1, and certainly you can adjust that up or down a couple levels if we need to, and then we kind of push those leads up higher, up to the T7 area. And that's why we get the coverage of the low back and the legs. So that's a good question. So you're not a surgical candidate, but you can do the stimulator. So some patients, you know, let's say you have an elderly patient, you know, you got stents in your heart, maybe you have COPD, maybe, you know, a lot of reasons people can be unhealthy or have comorbidities, and maybe surgery's just not safe. Maybe, maybe you need a five level fusion or maybe you have a really bad scoliotic curve and it would be an extensive surgery and you know, the surgeon doesn't think it's safe or the anesthesiologist doesn't think it's safe to even pursue surgery. You know, then you're kind of stuck. You know, we all recognize there's problems and there's certainly things to fix, but surgery itself is too risky. Other things that you would think about are you know, uh, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe they get MRIs 
But like I said, you had back surgery, you unpinched the nerve, and all the updated MRIs look great, but you still kind of got that nerve pain down the leg because the nerve got damaged. So the surgeons would say, hey, like, we unpinched it. It looks great. There's nothing, you know, we would cut you open and then we don't even know what we would do. That would be a person who would not be a surgical candidate. You just have a pinched, uh, a damaged nerve at this point from it being pinched too long. So a stimulator would be a good option at that point. That's a good question too. So, like I said, this is not immediate. So let's say I did a trial today and, you know, the patient wakes up, we got the battery taped on their back. We program it, we turn it on, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's interesting to watch, but you know, they'll say, hey, do you feel it in your right foot? Do you feel it in your left foot? Do you feel it in your right thigh? You know, they start mapping out where these leads are and where you're feeling the pain. So then they kind of program it to where your areas of pain are and you can kind of feel that and then they'll lower the levels a little bit just under your threshold so you don't feel anything, you don't feel a tonic stimulation. And I tell patients to wait a day. You know, that first day you had surgery, but like I said, it takes about a day to wash in and wash out. And sometimes people get, you know, a little confusion. If ob obviously if your pain is all in your legs and you put the stimulator in and the next day you say, wow, my legs are feeling much better, but I got a lot of back pain. Well, we did have to put the leads in. Those needles are relatively big. You have a little sore back for a day or two just we're just trying to get those leads in. But it can get a little confusing if you're having a stimulator place for back pain. So I have back pain, I do my stimulator, you know, I wake up the next day and I say, man, my back still kind of hurts. Well, maybe it's just the post-procedure pain, right? You got to put a big needle down there in the epidural space, still a little sore. You know, it's tough to tell what's helping, what's not. That, that's fair. You know, those people might take two days or three days to start. The needle pain goes away relatively quickly and then you have a better idea how much of your baseline pain is feeling better. So certainly it takes, we usually say a day to wash in or wash out or even at the end of a trial. You've had it in a week, it feels great, you're sad to have me pull it out at the end of the week. I pull the leads out, you're usually still feeling pretty good for another day before it kind of starts fizzling out. Yeah, I mean, I guess usually, not really elderly, but anyone, you know, back surgeries are not usually done on 20 year olds. So I don't get a lot of 20 year old people doing similar on these people in their, their 50s, their 60s, their 70s, you know. They've, they've, they've lived life, they've had surgeries, they've got nerve damage, things like that. But there's no specific age restrictions for these. I've certainly had some younger patients with some you know, bad luck who ended up with a peripheral neuropathy or something like that. And uh, we've, we've done similar trials and they've worked very well. So there's no like age limitations, but just, just the way medicine goes, it tends to be the older people who've just got a little bit more problems or have had multiple surgeries already. Um, so upper back pain, if you're still talking, I mean, certainly you can put in two leads. Each of these IPGs can cover two leads. If you do a DRG, you can put up to four. Um, but certainly if you're having other pains, um, I don't know the specific case, but certainly you can put in another lead. Um, I know patients who have had neck surgery and back surgery and they have a, they have two batteries in their back, one for the neck and one for the low back. So that definitely happens. Um, certainly a little bit more rare, but I have seen it happen. Yep, so sciatic nerve pain, that is uh, another way of saying that is just the radicular pain. So if you, have, if you are pinching a nerve in your spine and you have sciatic pain suiting down your leg, you know, that is nerve pain and stimulators work well for this. But keep in mind, you know, stimulators are at the, at the end of the treatment, right? So if you, let's say I had sciatic pain and it started tomorrow, you know, and it was severe, you know, I'd go see my doctor, you know, as long as I'm not experiencing any like leg weakness or really severe things, they'd probably get me in physical therapy, they'd give me some pain medicine, eventually get an MRI, see what the problem is. If I had a big disc herniation and pinging one of my nerves causing my sciatic pain, you know, I don't want to put a stimulator in and just mask that. You know, maybe I do an epidural or a couple epidural injections and try to calm that nerve down, control the inflammation, swelling, allow that disc to heal for a time, and maybe I can avoid surgery and an implant or anything. Um, unfortunately, if the epidurals fail, maybe I do need to go to surgery and have a little discectomy and cut that disc off my nerve. You know, that'd be a fix and then I'm good to go. 
Uh, so the stimulators, it is good for sciatic pain, but certainly don't forget that there is a long pathway of other less invasive treatments that work well, are well established, and as you work through that process, you know, you and your provider can decide where this is going to go should those easier things fail. You can. I mean, um, it might be a little bit more difficult um, trying to fish the leads up and following the spine, but it certainly is doable. I think, uh, like I said, some of the prep work we do before these trials is to get MRIs of the low back and of the thoracic spine so we can kind of see what we're going up against. And obviously, if you have a severe scoliotic curve or a severe thoracic kyphosis, that will make driving the leads a little bit harder, um, but certainly not impossible. I think a lot of the times what we're looking for on those MRIs is, you know, maybe we're addressing low back and leg pain, but maybe you have a disc protrusion up at like T9 that it's not causing any problems, but it's kind of leaning up a bit some stuff. It might make it hard to drive a lead through there. So that's why we get MRIs ahead of time to see what we're dealing with. Um, another thing I didn't talk about before, but what if we do have a hard time getting the leads in? Maybe we can only get one lead up because it was too hard to get the other one. But even with one lead, it's a successful trial, and the patient wants to put this in, and we think to ourselves, wow, that was a really hard trial. We really struggled trying to get those leads in. There's, instead of putting a, a, a lead in, instead of a lead, you can put what they call as a paddle. Think of it as two leads put together into one big paddle, and that's implanted surgically by a spine surgeon. So a pain doc wouldn't do that. Um, they would go in and maybe avoid the whole trying to fish a lead up your spine. They can go in, just cut a little bit of the bone out, and slide that paddle in exactly where it's supposed to be, and now you're not trying to fish anything up the spine. And that is certainly an option that we use sometimes if we have really difficult trials and we don't think it's safe or, you know, not sure if we can get the lead back up that high again. So certainly, as you work through this, this is something that maybe you provide. Maybe, maybe you have a successful trial and he says, you know what? you'd be better off going to get a paddle with one of the surgeons because of how difficult the trial was, and that does happen.